Well, this is the seventh and final part of our series about forgiving others and embracing forgiveness for ourselves. And we discovered that the two issues of forgiving and being forgiven are part of a complete circle of fellowship with God. And Jesus taught that God forgives us as we also are forgiving others. To not forgive others as he has forgiven us breaks the circle of fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Now, I've noticed a couple of things this week. Uh, you know, I've listening to the radio and different things. There's a lot of uh, unforgiveness out there <laughs> following this election cycle. Uh, you know, I, I heard from people on the radio, they were being interviewed, and, and they said that uh, they would not be able to go, go have Thanksgiving with their families this year because of such animosity that was expressed on Facebook during the election time, you know. Can you believe that? I mean, it's, uh, you know, not much forgiveness in that. And so we are all called to forgive one another as God has forgiven us. And if you have somebody that you're really upset with, especially in this body of Christ, the portion of the body of Christ that meets here, you know, go ahead and forgive them today if you would. You know, so that when we get to communion time at the end of the sermon, you know, we'll all have a clean heart and a clear heart about these things, all right? So, uh, well, we couldn't really leave this subject today unless we went to the very familiar parable of the prodigal son. And so turn in the Bible this morning to Luke chapter 15. And we, uh, beginning in verse 11... We shall see in this story that a father has two sons. And, and the youngest son receives a great inheritance gift from his father at, at his request. And he, but he, he breaks fellowship with his father by leaving then with all of these possessions that he's been given and abandoning fellowship with his dad. And, and then the second son also receives a great inheritance gift from his father but breaks fellowship with his dad uh, because he refuses to love and accept and forgive his brother, who returned in deep repentance for his wayward life. The reality, though, is that both sons, in their hearts, had already broken fellowship with their father before they ever received this inheritance gift, and the one leaving home, the other one keeping a distance from his father and refusing to forgive his brother. So the heart was the problem there. The parable ends with the youngest son having a wonderful relationship and fellowship with his father renewed and restored. Uh, and because it was, this was because of his dad's grace to forgive and restore him to the family. And the older son, in the end, continued, though, in lost fellowship with both his father and his brother. The context for this story... You know, most of the stories that Jesus shared as parables have a particular context. And the context for this story was that Jesus welcomed the wayward tax collectors and sinners into fellowship, inviting them to eat a meal with him, to fellowship with him, and to become his followers. Uh, while the Pharisees and the scribes rejected uh, acceptance and fellowship with both Jesus and these newly forgiven and restored wayward persons. Now, in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, we begin the parable. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. Now, like all normal fathers, this man longs for a close fellowship and relationship with his sons. You know, I know I have that with my children. I want to know them and be part of their lives and then be part of my life. And so uh, that the true son uh, goes beyond, way beyond the, the biological connection with the father. When you, when you are a father and a son, a father and a daughter, you know, there's that bond that you want to have together. And it's not always completely biological in nature. Uh, true sons and fathers walk in unity and mutual acceptance of one another. True sons and fathers share the family resources. Uh, together for the good of the whole family. In verse 12, we continue. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them, both sons, he divided to them his livelihood. 
Now the portion the youngest son would inherit was one-third of his father's livelihood. The remaining two-thirds would go to the oldest son. This was the tradition that they followed back then. The unusual part of this story is that the father was willing to give his two sons all his livelihood before he had died. Uh, the youngest son asked and received what he wanted. The older son accepted his inheritance without protest. In other words, he says, okay, if you want to give it to me, I'm going to take it, you know. And uh, so he received his as well without any protest at all, indicating something about his heart. The law for a father to assign inheritance to his sons before death allowed it. It was very rare that this was ever, ever done during these days. And and it, it, it almost never went into effect until the father's death. He, the father was allowed to even participate in the possessions and continue to enjoy them until he died. But uh, there is no historical evidence of this ever being done among the Jews. So the story that Jesus tells here is quite unusual, and it would gain a lot of attention because it was unusual in nature. It would have been shocking for a son to ask for an early inheritance uh, and even more shocking for the father to give it. Uh, the village, the community, the people around would have been extremely surprised uh, that this happened. And for a son to ask for his inheritance in advance would have been considered by that extended community as a shameful and insulting thing for his father. It would have been essentially seen as the son wishing the death of his father and when the old man did not die soon enough so to them ask for the advanced inheritance. So uh, the neighbors and friends of this father would have pledged themselves that if they ever saw that young man again after he left home, that they would be sure to tell him what they thought and to taunt him and to re rebuke him severely and bring great shame upon him. And even the older son would have been shamed because he accepted the advanced inheritance rather than waiting for his father's death. Now, it was a shock to everyone that the father liquidated the younger son's inheritance so that he could leave then and take it with him, as the father had the right to live off of that, those possessions until he died. Uh, can you imagine how this father must, must have felt when he realized that his sons loved money and possessions more than they loved him? Yet he let them go on their own way and do their own thing with the apparent hope that they would turn to him and return his gracious favor and his love and acceptance that he had given them. The point is that the father was giving the two sons what they had not earned. The inheritance technically became a gift of unmerited grace uh, because they, didn't, they had not earned this. He had, they would need, not even be in line to receive it until he died in most, uh, most of the time. In essence, the two biological sons would not have been viewed as true sons because they were so willing to break fellowship with their dad. There was a deep disconnect between father and sons. The old man must have been extremely lonely, because as I shared before, this disconnect had already happened long before the younger son left with his inheritance and the older son received it without protest. Their hearts were far from their father. And you know, you can sense when somebody's disconnected from you, can't you? And this, uh, this older father, he must have been very lonely and uh, experiencing uh, this thing that uh, left him feeling like that uh, there was not a, a connection there with his sons. This longing for his sons was the overwhelming motivation of this man's heart that speaks to us of God the Father and his overwhelming desire for deep and beautiful unbroken fellowship with us. He has offered us his great grace without us ever earning it. It's up to us to, as to how we're going to receive that. But with, what, with, with that offer comes a longing that the gift will lead to a sweet and biting fellowship with God. And God our Father longs for a close fellowship and relationship with all of us, all of his children, a shared life of love and joy. That's what God wants with us in that intimate relationship and communion with him. In verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now, it took a while for the young son to liquidate this property, 
and turn it into money. But then he journeyed to a far country, meaning that he was, would be mixing with foreigners and especially would be leaving the people of Israel to spend his time with Gentiles. And the word prodigal means extravagant. The young son lived like there was no tomorrow, spending it as if it would never run out. And uh, I think everybody may go through a little phase like that with few exceptions, you know. Uh, but, you know, when I went away to college, I had $900 saved up from my high school jobs. And that would be the equivalent of about all oh, seven to, to $9,000 today. Uh, so it would have been multiplied in an amount. But at, at home, I'd never been out to eat anywhere but, but Dairy Queen. Uh, and maybe a couple of times at A&W Root Beer and then with the youth group at, at this truck stop where they serve pizza, you know. And, and I had never eaten breakfast anywhere but home. No Cracker Barrels. I had never eaten Mexican food. First time I ate Mexican food, I dipped my chip in, that, in some really hot sauce. Uh, and I put it in my mouth and I felt like my mouth was on fire. And then somebody said, you shouldn't be doing that. I put too much on there, you know. I had never eaten steak before I left home. And uh, needless to say, I went out to eat a lot with my friends when I went off to college, and I spent lots of money on an active social life. I went to concerts for the first time and even to a professional wrestling match. <laughs> I was free to do whatever I pleased until the money ran out, and it ran out. At the end of the school year, I was flat broke and having to sell record albums just to get home. It was a hard lesson learned. It wasn't quite as bad as feeding the pigs, but, you know. Verse 14, And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now history is recorded that there were ten famines, uh, at least ten famines in the Middle East during the time that Jesus would have been saying these words. And so the people would be familiar with the condition that a famine produced and that this son was, was facing and the price of food, of course, would have skyrocketed. No more steakhouse entrees for this guy. He would, couldn't even afford a White Castle mini burger, you know, Mike. <laughs> All his fair-weather friends abandoned him because he was out of money. He became dependent on a foreigner, a Gentile. Now, common practice used back then was probably, in, probably even used today in the workplace was to give someone uh, that you wanted to kind of move along, give them a job that was so distasteful to them that they wouldn't want to stay. And so this was the case it was in feeding of the swine, which was, was strictly forbidden by a, a Jewish uh, uh, young man and would have been seen as an abandonment of his religion. And you can just about read the devious mind of this <coughs> foreigner, this citizen. You can see the smirk on his face and his evil amusement as he watch, watches the Jewish boy feed his pigs. And his buddies, he and his buddies were probably making wagers on how long he would last. The wayward son's pride was, has finally been brought down. And this is what happens with all situations of pride. In verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The absent son came to his senses, and he repented. And in all these parables about, you know, Jesus talking about things that are lost and then found, the, the, you know, there's repentance that goes on and then followed by joy. And that's what happens here. But he decided that being a hired servant would be like, like being rich compared to the, his state of life here, here at the end, there in that foreign land. And, and so uh, he was picturing himself just going to his father and asking his father to hire him as a hired servant. Uh, and... And, the, you know, a hired servant lived in the village. They lived on their own. They paid their own bills. They, they would only go to the place of employment, uh, you know, to work. And then 
they would go back home to the village. And the son pictured himself as remaining independent from his father, perhaps even saving enough to pay back, make restitution for what had been lost. In verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a, a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now the father did the unthinkable thing. He ran to meet him while he was a ways off. And when this sort of thing happened, word would spread quickly throughout the community, throughout the surrounding area. And the people would gather in the village or in the town and they would wait for that young man to come into town and then they would spend the whole time as he walked through town going home taunting him and abusing him verbally and shaming him for all that he had done and how he had mistreated his father and insulted his father and how could a good son do that, you know, and all this. That's what he was subject to uh, if he came into town. But note here that the father met him before he got to town as he is a ways off. And his father not, doesn't just meet him, he runs to meet him and getting to him before the people have a chance to shame him and treats him with great compassion and tenderness as if he'd never been away. This father suffered humiliation and uh, rather than to allow his son to suffer shame, though he deserved it. The people would have been saying, can you believe what dad, you know, this guy's dad's doing? You know? And they would have been upset with him. This, of course, is what Christ has done for us. He endured being shamed by his own people, the people of his own country, uh, as in his own community, in order to go the, to the cross and give his life for us. Now, the father of this lost son fell on his neck, meaning that he embraced him with great affection. This joyful dad then kissed his son, which was a symbol that all was forgiven. And uh, the, you know, the, the word that's used here for kiss is actually uh, gives reference to the type of kiss that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a romantic type kiss, obviously, but it's a kiss that where he would kiss him several times to let him know you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. You know, and pro perhaps even saying those words as he kissed him. All is forgiven. So what does this tell us about God. When we make the choice to seek him out and we have a heart of repentance and we want to return to him, uh, he runs to us and he delights for us to reconcile with him and give it, for giving us of everything we have ever done that has broken fellowship with him. This father was not looking for a hired servant to make restitution to him, he was longing for the return of a true son, a son that had become true into a sweet and wonderful fellowship with him. But the father said to his servants in verse 22, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. The robe was likely his father's robe, one of his own robes, signifying at the party that the wayward son had been restored to the family. Uh, and the ring is a symbol of showing that he could be trusted again. Uh, and the shoes announce that he is a true son, not a servant. And so the relationship has been brought together once again. The fatted calf is prepared for the reconciliation party. When the father said to bring the fatted calf here and kill it, it may be an indication of an ancient custom that went on in those days. An animal was killed over the threshold of the house, and the guest of honor was asked to step over the blood spilled at the door, and this created a blood covenant between the guest and the host, making them one. So you get the picture here with the father and the son. When they slaughtered that, that uh, calf over the threshold, it would have been a symbol that father and son are one. They are one again. There is a sweet and wonderful fellowship that has been restored between father and son. Clearly, the relationship with his son is much more important to this father than the loss of wealth and the property that had been squandered by the son, been wasted by him in a foreign land. 
Now, this is a beautiful illustration for these tax collectors and sinners. Jesus welcomed them to follow him. He invited them to be a part of his, his fellowship. Uh, he forgave them. He blessed them. And, and he wanted them. He ate with them. Uh, and uh, signifying fellowship. And he had a reconciliation party with them, you might say. These tax collectors and sinners. He welcomed them into the kingdom of heaven, regardless of how much sinning and wasteful living that they had done. And the past was forgiven and forgotten. The same thing is true for, for all of us. The Heavenly Father is a prodigal father. He's an extravagant father in his love and grace. It is an amazing grace that he offers. He is extravagant in love and mercy. He is so prodigal that he gave his only begotten son to take the punishment of sin in our, on our behalf. And he gives and restores what was never earned. When God forgives us, he does not want us to just be dutiful hired servants. Uh, he never wants us to leave to go back to the village uh, and trying to figure out a way to make restitution. Restitution is no longer asked for. It's been forgiven. The debt has been forgiven. And so uh, the, the, he doesn't want that. Uh, but to be true sons and daughters, that's what he wants. Bound by love and grace. There was a story that was told of a, it's one of my favorite stories, told of a Spanish father whose son Paco had rebelled and ran away from home. And this broken-hearted father loved his son and was so willing to forgive and restore the relationship that he put an ad in the paper. Paco, this is your father. All is forgiven. Meet at the city square at 10 a.m. tomorrow. The next morning, 800 Pacos showed up at the city square. <laughs> Wanting to be restored to their fathers. Well, there's only one Paco that mattered. I hope he came. But what was the reaction of the older son to his father's forgiving and restoring his brother? And this story is told like another parable. In verse 25, Now this, his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. The older son is not happy that his brother has come home. He resents it. It's significant to note that he was angry and unwilling to enter, even to, to to enter into the house, even. Uh, a house that was for the family, the whole family. You see, this is the picture of the scribes and Pharisees and how they were when they saw Jesus rejoicing with tax collectors and sinners. They had received his invitation to the kingdom of God and their hearts were filled with anger and condemnation, not just toward the tax collectors and sinners, but toward Jesus too. Even though this son had not left the property to go to a far country, his heart is far from the heart of his father. And someone said a darkened heart is a far country. In his heart, this son was just as far from his father as the one who had left home. So he answered, in verse 29, So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I have nev I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. He next describes the relationship as that of a servant keeping his father's commandments rather than a son. Somehow in his heart he knew that he was not a true son to his father. And so he felt more like a servant, keeping the commandments of his father to go do this, do that, just like a servant. But do you see the connection with the scribes and Pharisees? They prided themselves in how they kept the commandments. They thought that legalistically keeping the commandments was what would make them righteous they saw their religion as a system of laws and traditions, but what was missing was a loving, joyful relationship with God. In reality, these scribes and Pharisees were just as far from God as the tax collectors and sinners had been. Then this estrangement from his father is revealed when he makes it known that his only desire is to make merry with his friends, not with his father and his brother. He only wants his father to provide the food for the party. 
in a, in a different way, he is just as much a user of his father's possessions as, as his brother had been. Verse 30, but as soon as this son of yours came, who was devoured, he has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you filled the fatted calf for him. Now there's no place in the story of the prodigal that says he, he did these things with harlots. That's, he made this up in his own mind. He refuses to acknowledge his brother just as these Pharisees refused to acknowledge these reformed tax collectors and sinners. The older son not only condemns his brother, but his father too for accepting and forgiving his brother. Verse 31, and he said to him, this is the father speaking, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. What is it that still separates this man from his father? It's his unwillingness to reconnect the circle of fellowship through forgiveness. It's the unforgiveness of his brother that keeps the fellowship from being restored. So what has this story told by Jesus spoken to us? It tells us that there is no one who is so far from God who cannot humble himself or herself and come home to the Lord and be forgiven and accepted with great love and joy by the Heavenly Father. Several weeks ago, we explored how an unwillingness to forgive others will break fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And that's the greatest consequence of all, isn't it? Jesus said that when we do not forgive, then we will not be forgiven. It is what the parable of the unforgiving servant was about. This story here in this parable so vividly describes how that works. The wonderful, generous, gracious father forgave the youngest son for his season of wasteful living, restoring him to complete fellowship with him, but the elder son, whose heart was also far removed from his father, could not bring himself to forgive his wayward brother. So his heart remained away from the true fellowship with his father that a, a son so desperately needs. The biggest thing in his life was still, the most important thing in his life was still missing. That he would be united in his heart with his father as one and with his brother. So... What God our Father longs for is that the circle of fellowship between him and his children remain unbroken. And if broken, be mended by forgiveness. All of us have been the prodigal son, forgiven by the Father. But somehow we are like, also like the, at times, like the older brother. Someone sins against us or offends us some, in some way and we desire that that person be punished. And our desire for their punishment is so great that we can't bring ourselves to forgive. And even if that person comes around and repents, we say, you know what, they really messed up here. I can't do that. We may even resent that God reaches out to them with love and acceptance and forgiveness. The circle of fellowship remains broken. And we are not told whether this older son ever came around to forgive his brother. But if any of us here is holding back from forgiving someone, the father reaches out with a longing plea to mend the circle of fellowship. So I guess the call to all of us is to search our hearts and see if there's a brother or sister in our life that we have been hurt by or offended by or, you know, it's kind of roughed us up in some way or, and we're still, we're still hard-hearted. We still have a hardness there in our hearts toward them. Well, guess what? When we have that hardness toward a brother and sister, the hardness really is even toward our Father in heaven as well because He wants us to forgive as He has forgiven us. He's forgiven us of such a great debt. And why wouldn't we forgive someone that owes a little debt to us? You know. So... The circle can be completed. So, mend the circle of fellowship in your heart today. And say, it by faith in the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive them. We're going to share communion in just a moment. And this is really what communion is about. 
You remember the reconciliation party that uh, the father had for his wayward son that had come home? Communion is a reconciliation party. That's what it is. It's a celebration that our Father has welcomed all of us home with the kiss of forgiveness. It is a celebration of the unbroken fellowship between us and Him as well as our brothers and sisters in Christ. God our Father provided the blood covenant, the sacrifice of His only begotten Son, so that we could be His children too. And that is what we celebrate today as His family when we take the bread and the cup together.